Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. this gorgeous piece. How do we approach it? How did you do yeah. it? Why is it so moving? Well, it's cast glass, so it's an unusual or not a common material for casting. Um, most people are familiar with bronze or iron in terms of casting, but this is glass that has been mold formed. Um, basically what I do is I build a, a pure wax positive um, and form a mold around that, what's called a refractory mold. Okay. Um, and the wax is melted out and the glass is melted in. So it's a very simple, perhaps 5,000 year old process. Um, it's just, you know, the, the, the distinctive things are the pieces are large yes. um, and they're complex. So that's what makes the casting challenging. Complex for the viewer or complex to do? Now I'm speaking just technically, okay. um, complex, complex to do. You know, there's a lot of variation from thick to thin, um, and that makes... Would you point that out to us? Um, so here, like this area is quite thick, you know, maybe 10 inches, 12 inches thick, and then all in the same segment, it's up to here, you know, one less than an inch. Um, and so that variation um, from thick to thin is difficult to achieve in glass. Glass naturally is an insulating material. So as this piece is cooling, it's cooling very slowly. Um, and the reason for the slow cooling is waiting for these thicker yes. areas to even out in temperature with these thinner areas. Do you have experience that uh, maybe it wasn't poured exactly right and that you have to redo it? And what does yes. that involve? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I do have that experience, unfortunately. unfortunately. Yeah. You know, when the work is technically challenging, it's yeah. very satisfying when yes. you sort of win. Um, but you do also experience the challenges of loss um, quite frequently. Um, and that does mean starting over, going back, building a new wax. Oh, you have to do that. Yes, oh, yes. Okay. So that, that far back in the process. Um, you know, there's a, a writer who I love named Libby Lumpkin who has a phrase, she said, um, making gives thought a location. Hmm. And I really like that idea yes. because it, um, it, it talks about the importance of craftsmanship. Yes. Um, because I am a big believer in, in craft. You know, many people think that conceptual art is superior to craft. But I sort of think I like that craft too. I like craft and I, I like to celebrate and pay attention to fine craftsmanship because it's really the vocabulary of the visual artist is how things are made. It's what material you choose and it's how you handle that material, you know. So doing it well, paying attention, dotting your I's and crossing your T's it's exceptionally important to getting your idea across to the viewer. You know, these pieces, they, they look ethereal. They, you yes, know, they, do. they look almost as if they've never been touched by human hands, you know, almost like an apparition. And I love glass for this reason. You know, it's almost otherworldly as it comes down. But the physicality of actually making it, you know, the pieces weigh between two and 500 pounds. Oh. <laughs> yeah. when, we're, when we're loading the thought. molds into the oven, yeah. it's loaded with a, a forklift, you know. Um, the glass comes from an industrial supplier, you know, everything is so muscular in the making. But the result is this sort of, almost like a breath of air, you know, it's so yes. simple. How do you keep it clean? Very simple, you know, we, um, I handle everything archivally, so okay. um, you mix a tiny bit of pure rubbing alcohol with water and then just spray it onto a rag and clean the piece, you know. 
and that's you know couldn't be easier. It's it's like is a it complicated window. Is it susceptible to chipping or? Um, how we've done it is you know I always um, very slightly facet every single edge so that uh, you don't have a sharp edge that's likely yes. to catch. And then in between the segments, it's cast um, in three segments. In between the segments are uh, is a very thin sheet of silicone. Oh, that's so, smart. Yeah, so that it's resistant to impact. Um, and so if someone was going to move this, they were going to take it apart into three sections. Yes. And then wrap it a lot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, every piece has a padded box. So, oh, yes. So they, the the segments travel in there. Made for the made, outlet. Yeah. Oh, made for interesting. The and is vibration uh, an issue if a taxi goes by and you live in the city or no, a fire truck? No, you know, not not that so much. Uh, the only time vibration becomes an issue would be like in an earthquake zone. Um, oh. But what um, I've done is, and I learned this from uh, two older artists who I admire very much, Professor Lubinsky and Mrs. Brichtova, um, there are small ball bearings in, in plastic, acrylic plastic ball bearings um, that key in and hold the, hold the piece in its proper orientation so it can't move. At the base or at the uh, just joints Just at the here? seams, just at the seams. At the seams? Yeah, just at the oh, seams. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Do you want to explain something about the design of this kimono? Ah. So this is a Mako. So this is a single woman who is available. Okay. Um, and you can tell because of the length of the sleeves. Um, long sleeves are considered uh, like a very flirtatious, you know, and they're used in gesture and, you know, as sort of a, uh, an expressive um, element. And the other thing that you can, the way that you'll know that she's available is the back collar of the kimono is actually dipped down. It's lower? It's lower. A married woman wears her kimono right against her neck, but an available woman, I in Japan, the back, back of the neck, neck is very it's appealing. It's very appealing to men. Um, so this is a real um, erogenous zone in Japanese culture. So um, when a woman is available, she sort of dips down the back of her kimono um, and shakes her kimono sleeves and, you know. These are tomomboko boxes. What they are are wooden boxes. boxes that accompany ceramic pieces. For example, all of the objects from tea ceremony, each object has its box. And the box often has calligraphy on it that could be put there by a, an owner. Um, and you know these are these are historic pieces, and they're highly valued. So um, you know I saw one one tea bowl box that was owned by a famous poet at one point, and on the interior of the top of the box, he had written a small poem, poem. to the tea bowl. And you know hundreds of years ago, and now that poem accompanies the tea bowl, you know, as it travels in its box, you know, nice. through time into the future. You know, so these, that idea fascinated me. And um, when I went to make some ceramic pieces, you know, after the Japanese experience, I had never worked with ceramic. But this incredible sensitivity to ceramics and this idea of the ceramic piece and the box, that really inspired me to make some ceramic pieces and also to make boxes that would accompany them. So in the boxes you have now, do you do a poem occasionally? <laughs> <laughs> no, I am not a poet. <laughs> but I kind of had this imagination that maybe the people who, who acquired the pieces, or as time went on, like maybe in the yes. future, that somebody would add something to the box or you know, write something on the inside, you know. I think, have you seen, you know the Temple of Dendor at the uh, Yes, Met? yes. You know there's graffiti carved in on the inside from like the fourth century or whatever. No, you know, there's this I wasn't aware in, of that. With Roman numerals, someone oh, wrote yes. their name and um, signed the date in Roman numerals. And I just love that, the idea that like someone in the past is like, I am here. Yeah, the quest for immortality. Yeah. So this piece is titled Chado. And chado is the Japanese word for tea ceremony, actually. 
and yeah. um, it's sort of the most traditional of all of the works. Um, it's in ceramic, um, and ceramic is the first material I actually worked with when I came back from Japan, thinking very much about those objects from tea ceremony. And the glaze is actually celadon glaze. Oh, really? Yes. And, you know, glaze is basically glass. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I really wanted was this crackling, um, which is this fine crackling. It creates this net uh, across the surface. And um, so this was, this was one of the first celadon pieces. And it was just thrilling. Celadon, actually, you might not know, it, um, the, what makes it green is there's iron in there. Oh, no idea. Yeah, yeah, so you mix iron oxide, which is rust. Right. And so when this piece went into the kiln, it was probably the color of your dress. It's this very bright pink. Um, and then in the firing, you put it in a gas-rich environment. And what happens is the gas is so hungry for oxygen, it pulls the oxygen molecules out of the rust and turns it from pink back to green, or from red back to green. So if you fired it more or less, does that change the hue of the green? The amount of uh, iron oxide that's in the, the glaze, glaze mix is what changes the hue. And I did experiment with that, actually. I put in more and less yes. um, to see different hues. And it was amazing. It, it was absolutely thrilling, amazing. Really. Totally thrilling. It's nothing short of magic when, you know, when the kiln door opened and the piece that had been bright pink when I loaded it in <laughs> came out green. I was just amazed, absolutely amazed. Did you look or did you paint on for depth and shadow? You know, I did not, but what ended up naturally happening, there was sort of this reaction between the texture. Oh, this I is see. This is the texture of the Obijima. Yes. Um, and that, the high points, that because it's glass and it's liquid at the high point in the firing, yes. it flows away from those high ridges. And so we ended up getting these highlights and this pronounced texture and in the back on the drapery you can really see the the yes. glaze articulates Almost, yes. the texture um, so the obi i uh, mentioned the aesthetic philosophy wabi sabi yes one of the elements or sort of uh, aspects of that is asymmetry um, so here this is a bow but actually both sides of what would be the bow are on one side and the two tails are on the other side. Um, and visually it's, you know, we might think of everything as beautiful in Western culture as being symmetric. Symmetrical. Um, but there's a lot of intrigue in the asymmetry. Um, and for me, it's almost more beautiful in many ways. So, and this is a very contemporary, a contemporary tying of the obi. Would it have any significance? Not Does it say anything? No, nothing, nothing, nothing didactic. Just um, that's really beautiful, though. Yeah, a bouquet of flowers. Yeah, it does. It looks like a bouquet of flowers. And I love this. This yes, roll. I was just noticing. Isn't that. that? Yeah, there's some kimonos that are perhaps more padded? formal. Yeah. yeah, it's a padded roll on the bottom. Um, and so some of them, you know, I worked with all kimonos that I uh, picked up in Japan, but some of them I actually created the padded roll because I really liked it and I liked the weight of it and how it affected the, the drapery of the, of the rest of the kimono. Another thing I noticed in Japan was the way they used gold leaf. Mm -hmm. um, in the temples, if you go into a temple, for example, there'll be no artificial lighting. There'll maybe be a few candles, but back on you know what the altar area, to draw light to an object, they actually gold leaf it. So in the darkness, you'll see a small statue that is completely covered in gold leaf, not because gold is expensive, not because to indicate value, right. but to bathe it in light, basically. And so I started working with um, three types of ceramic, white, black, and then red, you know, classic terracotta. And I really enjoyed combining the deep darkness of this unglazed black with the light provided by the gold leaf. 
um, and that became one of my favorite contrasts. Does gold leaf come in various shades of gold? It does, actually. Um, most gold leaf is made in Italy. These are all things I learned. Oh, good. <laughs> Eager to learn way, myself. <laughs> and the way it's made, they put it between, they put a piece of gold between two pieces of leather and actually pound it and pound it out into this thin, thin. delicate, like tissue paper thin piece of gold. Um, and when you're gold leafing, what you do is you paint on um, an organic uh, glue, glue, basically, and you wait till it gets just the right amount of sticky, and then you have to transfer this gossamer thin piece of gold with a brush that's made out of badger's tail fur. Um, <laughs> and you, you get some static going by rubbing it back and forth, and you pick up this gold leaf, and then you move it over, and Oh, as it's approaching, it just goes and it sucks onto the surface. Um, and you can't breathe, you can't, be, you can't have any breeze in your studio or anything like that. So I would take a breath in and then I would move <laughs> the gold leaf over. It was fun. It was fun. <laughs> and this is, has some gold on the front. Yeah, I ended up um, putting gold on the entire obi. The floral components, in, as I was experimenting, what I did was I put real flowers into the molds before I pressed the clay in. Oh my god, fabulous. And then when the clay fired, the flowers would burn away and they would leave this perfect detailed impression. Yeah. So when I saw it, I was thrilled. I was like, that's great. But then I had the idea um, to gold leaf just, just those flowers. Um, and so in a way, it's the, uh, taking the place of the way the um, kimono fabric would have flowers painted on it, that this is the real impression of the flower that's been highlighted. That must gold. have been so exciting it for you. It was thrilling. <laughs> 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 it was so much fun. So after the ceramic work, um, I immediately thought there was a parallel in my mind between the celebration of impermanence in wabi-sabi and mano no aware and rusting metal. The ceramic factory in the Denmark was actually an abandoned brick factory. Oh. And so I was around a lot of equipment that was deteriorating. And I thought, isn't that really beautiful in yes. one way, you know? And so I had the idea to cast some kimonos in iron, but then intentionally rust them, you know? And everybody said to me initially, oh, you should work with core 10 steel. But oh. casting core 10 steel is very, very, very difficult. I forget what the temperature is, but you have to go to such a high temperature to cast it. So I found a, a chemist, um, a, um, a metallurgist right. who was running a foundry in Italy, and he returned to a formulation of bridge, bridge oh. iron, yeah. And so this is a formulation of iron used for, you know, those beautiful subway stops in Paris or, yes. you know, all of the bridges in Germany. So it's very durable long term and rust resistant. And what we did was we sprayed it with a combination of chemicals to inspire Start the rust. The, yeah, the, the, the rusting process. Does this material give you latitude or restriction in terms of form I or feel design? Latitude. Really? Um, Say how, well, if you would. Yeah, when metal casts, um, it casts at a temperature where it flows like water. The metal is actually extremely liquid. When glass casts, it flows like honey. Um, so the, the thinness of the wall and the uh, response to the, the textures of the piece um, you get a little bit higher definition with metal and a little bit thinner walls. And then actually, so the two metals I cast were bronze and iron. And you know, the bronze I took a totally traditional approach with this is um, the verde patina, very, very classical. But I used it to sort of highlight the aspects of dress. But the rust, when I started um, doing the intentional rusting, 
Did you know that rust grows in flowers? I did not. They actually call it a bloom. I've heard the name bloom, but yes. I didn't know it was so specific. Rust, yeah, rust actually blooms. And when the piece was wet and we were treating it with the chemicals to start the rust, you could actually see the rust opening up like, like flowers. It was so beautiful. It was um, beautiful. And I just thought, isn't that interesting? Like, here's this destructive thing we think of as rust, but it sort of... Has a life of its own. It does have or, a life of its own. Oh, very interesting. As you picked out, uh, this is similar. Yeah. Should I check the front? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, you know, I could, uh, very frequently I would um, create the same piece in different materials to actually compare. Oh, show us that. That was yeah, so yeah. interesting to, to hear. To compare the effect of the materials. Okay, for example, this is the dancing, the dancer in the traditional bronze with the green, you know, green highlighting the collar and the OB. Um, then here she is in simple um, terracotta. Hmm. And I used the gold to oh, yeah. highlight the, the impression yeah. of the flower. And then here she is in rust. You know, until I started looking, I wasn't seeing. Isn't that interesting? Uh, that's really a surprise to me that the, the materials threw me off because I started to relate to the materials yep. and not the underlying design. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting. I now know to see better. So in terms of emotional um, experience of the different materials in the same pose, mm -hmm. how is it for you? For me, and I sort of, I've thought about it a lot, um, the tradition of bronze is sort of an expression of everything that's stayed or established. You know, if you think about a culture, when we create a monument to something we value and we feel is important, we make it in bronze. Right. You know, um, for longevity. For longevity, exactly. Timelessness. Ceramic, because I literally um, was at a factory where they were taking the ceramic out of the ground. I think of ceramic for its humility. You know, it is really the most um, hmm. unassuming of materials. Every culture uses ceramic and every culture digs it out of, you know, their area of our planet, you know, and they just pick up some of the earth and then they form it. Um, the rust is, of course, for me, the impermanence. It has simultaneously an industrial um, reference and because it's, it's rusting and decomposing ever so slowly, you know, probably over thousands of years, it does speak of impermanence. And then the glass, for me, is always this delicate balance between material, like it's, it is, you know, heavy and present and physical, but it's so immaterial because of its translucency. You know, in sort of comparing some of these acts that we're doing now, uh, and even when we walked around, I was most moved by this, and I mm. just didn't understand why, because <laughs> I just really didn't understand it. Uh, I mean, inside I didn't understand it. But now I'm coming to the recognition that the rust is mirroring or expressing what is, you could call a curtsy or a bow, but really is a descent. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Into death. Yeah. yeah. Into decay or into something like that. Yes. So the red glaze, sometimes they refer to it as ox blood. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it really is. It's this very sort of lifeblood red. Um, you know, red is my favorite color. Oh, um. <laughs> interesting. For a girl who wears black. I know, I know. <laughs> well, I do have, um, for special occasions, I have all different tones of red pants that I like to wear. Good for you. <laughs> um, but I like it because it's so bold. Yes. Um, and, you know, it is, you know, the color of blood, which is life, you know. And so this was what, one of my favorite pieces. This was actually one of the most complicated you can see there's one, two, three layers of, of the kimonos. Um, and so this is an inner kimono. And it's then like four layers. Yeah, 
It's this and then two, two here and there. So yeah. that's, I count four. Four, exactly. So this is inner and then there's one, two, three on oh, the outer. Yes. Yeah. And um, so that was that complicated in, in the dressing. Um, but what I loved about it is it had this really pronounced embroidery down here. And the red glaze, as it was dripping down, it really sort of highlighted that. Now this doesn't have the variation in color that the no, Celadon, the so this is what you put in is what you get out. Yeah, this, <laughs> this is a little bit more. But you know what started happening with the red glaze is, you know, glaze is always a learning experience. The first time you do it, you get a surprise, no matter how many test firings you do. And what I loved here was how um, the higher areas, like where the glaze thinned out, it became this brighter, more orange red. Um, and then the thicker areas, it sort of darkened down. And you can sort of get this little bit, just a little hint of this streaming, which speaks of the firing process, you know, that the, the glaze is actually liquid over the entire piece at a certain point during the firing at the highest, highest temperature. So this piece is actually titled Bijin, which means beauty. Um, but like a woman, you would say, you know, oh, she's a real Bijin, you know, like oh. she's a real looker, but it's oh. in Japanese. Um, so Bijin means beauty. Um, and the funniest thing that I learned about rust, and it's again one of those things that sounds obvious once you say it out loud, but different rain and different physical environments creates different colors of rust. So mm. the foundry that I cast all of the iron pieces at is in Tuscany. And um, it's, so the, you know, the ocean is here, there are plains here, the town is called Pietra Santa, it's right here. And there, then there are the Apuanian Alps. Yes. Um, and so the clouds, the weather gather there, and then it rains on the flat plain, and then the sun heats the ocean and, and sends more um, water up. So they have this nice little cycle. And it's quite rainy. And the rain that is m made creates this rust that is a very light um, color. And what happened was, so there are great periods of time, like during the summer, when you know it's great weather all of the time, there's no rain. So I took a piece back up to Prague, and I thought, oh, I'll rust it up there. But when I rusted it up there, the rust was this like dark, stormy, you know, kind of more reddish, blackish. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't this light yellow yeah, that stunning. I really wanted. Oh, I just love it. That's really great. Thank, <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you. To contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones the Spark. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.